Hello, and welcome to Represent NYC on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you for joining us. I'm New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. It's my job to serve as the state's chief financial officer, making sure New York is on solid financial ground. New York City is a major part of our state economy, so I keep a close eye on what's happening in the five boroughs. Today I'll be discussing the role of labor in the city's economy and the recently concluded 2018 state legislative session. My first guest, Vincent Alvarez, began his career fighting for workers' rights with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 3, in Flushing, Queens. Today, he is president of the New York City Central Labor Council. Vinny, it's great to see you. Well, Thanks good. for being on the show. It's great to be here. I appreciate uh, having me on board and uh, on your show today. Well, labor's in the news a lot these days, and, and you know it from uh, the ground up, working in Local 3 and working through the chairs at Central Labor Council in the forefront of what's happening with organized labor here in New York City. Uh, first, uh, for our viewers who may not be fully aware, tell us what the Central Labor Council is and what the role is. Well, the Central Labor Council is an affiliated body of the National AFL-CIO, who has over 400 uh, organizations like ours. Uh, throughout the nation. We're the largest regional labor federation in the country. We represent uh, over a million workers, about 1.2, 1.3 million workers. They come from about 300 different unions, public sector unions, private sector unions, construction trade unions, and we work with them on advocacy and advancing workers' rights, not only for them, but for all working people throughout the city. It's a great job. I'm, I'm privileged to, to have it for the past seven years and I work with a great bunch of people. Must not always be easy to get three, 300 unions, you said, to try to uh, be united on, on some issues. I'm sure there are times uh, might be some differences of opinion uh, and, and, and some more local interests, but that seems to me to be a very key role for, for the, the CLC to be the, the focal point of providing a united front. And many would argue today labor is under attack uh, across the country. So a lot is on, on your shoulders. How, how do you build that sense of solidarity among you know, private sector unions, public sector unions, big unions, small unions, got some, your colleagues have strong personalities too, I might add. They're all friends and I know them well, but uh, that's, that's, that's a lot for you to manage. Well, they all, they all have an interest in making sure that, that the workers that they represent in their respective industries, that, that their economic well-being is improved, that they have opportunity that they might not otherwise have if they didn't have the benefits of uh, being represented collectively in the workplace. You're right. There is an attack on labor. This is an attack that's been taking place really now for the better part of three-plus decades. It's mm -hmm. a coordinated attack. It's a well-financed attack. It's an attack that's taking place uh, throughout the country, region to region. Um, in every sector. It's targeted right now certainly on the public sector unions, but a lot of unions, uh, private sector union members as well have been targeted throughout the country. But what's really, I think, uh, a problem is, is that we see ultimately that it's, it's hurting all working people. Mm -hmm. That even though this attack is directed um, at some of the, the really the most anti-worker, corporate-backed, well-financed people throughout this country, that even though we see it attack, th that they see this attack directed at working, at, at unionized workers, it's affecting all working people because we've lifted traditionally over the years, we've lifted the floor for all working people yeah. in this country, yeah. and it bears itself out. And the recent victory on raising the minimum wage sure. and certainly is an example of that. Sure, well ultimately what we want to do is raise wages in this country, and you talked about wages and you talked about the attacks, um, and we're referring to the recent Supreme Court case yeah. in, in the Ask Me Janice case, yeah. Um, and really what you have to do is if you look at the statistics and you look at this, this 30 or 40 year time period, you see, so, you see where workers' uh, voice is limited, where the attacks have, have really uh, taken a hold in some of these states throughout the country, mm. we see the effects of it. So in right to work states, you see lower wages. You, know, you see uh, union workers are making $11,000 more than their non-union counterparts. That, that's roughly 13% more. That's real money. That's real, uh, that makes a real difference for families, for working class families throughout this country. And you know what's different too today, I think, that, that we haven't seen since 15 or, or so years in this country is support for unions. 61% mm. of, of working people today say that they support uh, that they support unions, that they view them favorably, and that's because they just want to restore some balance yeah. in the workplace. I think, you know, I think some of that was uh, evidenced by the vote last year on the Constitutional Convention in New York State. And the, uh, labor was very concerned about some of the protections, pension and otherwise, that, that might have been affected. And all the polling showed that it was going to pass. And it was really labor that, that, that led the argument to point out not just on labor issues, but environment, education, so many other issues that were important that could be altered in a very negative way. 
and uh, the vote ended up being over 80% negative vote. And I really do credit labor for um, galvanizing uh, the attention on that issue. So I think it does show that people, uh, in New York anyway, uh, ascribe a lot of credibility. I hope people don't forget where they came from. You know, when, when I've spoken to you and your colleagues, you know, I, was, I always remember my uh, dad being uh, uh, a union guy, uh, a shop steward for a period of time, and my mom was a public sector worker. And New York State continues to, we have the highest percentage of unionized workforce right. of any state in the nation. A and, and despite those threats, so I do think that there's an advantage and, and credit to union leaders like yourself who do the right thing, are responsible to the larger community, not just your own constituency, that, that while we've seen other previously labor-friendly states go in the wrong direction, Midwest particularly, I, I don't think that's going to happen here in New York. What do you think? Well, I don't think so either. And, I, and, and I, it's, not in anybody's, it's not in anybody's interest that that happens. In those right-to-work states that you've mentioned, if you look at poverty rates, we talked about income and we talked about the ability for, for working people to raise, uh, to have our, a, a likelihood that they're going to have higher wages in the union uh, and having a union in the workplace in the non-right-to-work states. But if you look at right-to-work states too and you look at poverty rates, and this is something that you and I have talked about and making sure that we have economic growth which is going to sustain the priorities and be able to, to allow states and cities to have uh, the priorities fun fully funded in their municipal budget. So if you look at poverty rates in, in right to work states, they're, sub they're substantially higher. They're 15.3% versus 12.8% in non-right to work states. So there's a lot of statistical evidence that we could look at that when workers have a voice when work is in the workplace and when workers can come together collectively to exercise that right, that not only do they do better, but the communities in which they live do better. All working people do better. So we're going to continue to fight for that here. You mentioned the Janus decision. That's been very hot in the news and affects the public sector unions. Supreme Court decision that basically said the so-called agency fee, the, the requirement that non-members who get the benefit of representation without being members, that they have to pay a certain uh, fee. Now that's uh, change because of the court decision, a 5-4 decision, uh, probably not unanticipated given the current makeup of the court. Uh, what do you see as the, the response? Is it, is it gloom and doom? Is, is this the end of, of public sector union strength to have a voice? Or um, just how do, you, how do you see the reaction to it among the ranks of unions? So those that are very negative on unions, they're hailing it as a major turning point. Is that really what this is? Absolutely not, because well, firstly, everybody knows who, who's a union member what the statistics are, and we just mentioned them, and the benefits, what it really means. I mean, this is real, this is a, a real financial difference, in for, not only for them, but for their families when they have a voice in the workplace. So we know, so they know what that means, and they're going to continue to support their unions uh, here in New York City and here throughout our state as, as well. We have uh, about 25 percent workers. Uh, in this city are unionized, one in four workers. We have a history of support for the trade union movement in this city because we know what it means to the, to the economic well-being of the city and for workers. And we also have elected officials like yourself and other elected officials throughout the state. The governor, the mayor here have been helpful and the legislators have been helpful at doing what they can to help lift up and support the labor movement because they know that it benefits every worker. So we, can, we, will, we will continue to do the outreach and the connection that we have to members to make sure that we're talking to them about the value of being uh, of having that voice at work and being in a union because there are other folks out there that are in their ear unfortunately and we've talked about it. they're very well financed and they are out there and they're trying to tell a different story well it, it also will and i think it, you, we've seen it before the, the decision was rendered uh... it requires the unions to do uh, a more uh, effective job of communicating what are the strengths of being in the union and how important it is to support the union. And, uh, you know, my uh, view as to where it's at right now, in fact, the unions have been prepared for this and have been laying the groundwork to remind their members how important it is to continue to support the union for all the reasons that you've, you know, so elo eloquently stated. So, I mean, my view is that those that have view this as the, you know, the end of public sector union strength, they, they are somewhat uh, celebrating a little too soon. That's not really what is going to be the reaction. In fact, some would argue that this will, in the long run, strengthen the unions because, then, in fact, they will, it, it will require a closer relationship between the members and the leadership. And it doesn't prevent us from doing the things that hopefully we've all done in the past and will continue to do and make sure that we're talking to our members, not even just about wages, but about yeah. safety in the workplace, yeah. about protections if they're injured on the job, about retirement security, yeah. which we've both talked about all the time. All the time. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a lot of issues that we will continue to communicate with our yeah. members about. Yeah. Certainly for New York State, we talk about all the time, 
so much of the state's economy is driven by what happens here in the city. And the city's economy has been strong. Uh, we hope it continues. You know, the question as to how long it will continue. Every recovery has a slowdown at a certain point. And you mentioned the high percentage of the workforce that is unionized here in the city. Part of the strength of the city, though, is that the economy is different than it was you know, 20, 30 years ago. It's a more diversified economy. You know, you're seeing a lot of small businesses. You're seeing the tech center growing. I don't know if that's an area where you have many, you know, union represented uh, jobs. On the other hand, we see the strength of construction. Right. We see that healthcare consistently uh, grows in terms of employment, uh, the social service area, hospitality, you know, the hotels uh, in that sector. The, many of these are very high, highly unionized sectors. Where do you see the changes in the states, uh, in the city's economy, impacting on how labor uh, organizes its members, how the unions uh, uh, manage and navigate through a changing economic landscape? Well, certainly our, our economy has changed and diversified. I think that's a good thing. It's, it's diversified a lot over the past decade or so here in New York City, and that's, uh, that is beneficial for, for all of us here in the city, not only for the workers, but for industry, our industry partners and allies as well. Um, but the nature of work has changed as well. And there is a, a, a tremendous rise in non-traditional work and contingent work and freelances in, in uh, 1099s and gig economy work. And that is something that even though that those work, that, that is a new reality of the economy. So while our economy is changing, the nature of work is changing as well. And, but they're still facing the same issues in the workplace and outside of the workplace mm. that are gonna require us to, to work with them to somehow collectively all of us make sure that we come together in industries like you mentioned tech that maybe weren't traditionally organized and say hey how do you have a, how do you have very simply a voice in the workplace to mm -hmm. talk about your economic well-being to talk mm -hmm. about issues that you're facing in their various industries because each and every worker in these different industries are facing issues that there is no question about it if they go in and, and have a conversation with the employer if they have a conversation with their bosses individually on their own they may or may not be successful, but they're going to have a much higher degree of success when they go in and they talk uh, about these issues collectively. Mm. You know, before we, we started uh, our discussion, uh, before the camera, we were talking about some of the changing face of the labor movement uh, in terms of generational changes. In fact, when you became head of CLC, that was a generational change, and, and your, your counterpart at the state level, Mario Salento. Uh, what are you seeing as we move forward uh, with uh, a more diverse community generally, uh, a younger generation coming forward. Certainly we know New York continues to be, thankfully, uh, the place where immigrants feel very welcome and that certainly changes the face of the workforce as well. What will labor in New York City look like 10 years from now with the trends that you're starting to see today? Well, well certainly a lot of, I think the trends are going to continue that we see uh, higher levels of, of uh, minorities living in in New York City are also working in, in New York City. They, there is a huge gap with, the, with ge different generations now. I have two millennials, uh, children, and there is, there is a big gap, mm. uh, certainly between the different, between the Gen Xs, between the millennials, and between the baby boomer gap, and, and how they view the world, and how they view the workplace, and how they view work. And so our goal is gonna be to continue to make sure that we're bridging the gap between all of those, all of those different generations of workers as well as the different industries in which they work in and see if we could, what we can do to help them out and to make their lives, improve their lives just a little bit more. And with your leadership, Vinny Alvarez, I know that uh, Central Labor Council here in New York City is going to be successful. So we're just about out of time. I appreciate the dialogue. I appreciate you uh, having me on. Thanks, Vinny, for joining us. We're going to take a short break. We've been discussing labor issues with Vincent Alvarez, has the Central Labor Council for New York City. My next guest is going to be Senator Brad Hoylman. Thanks for watching Represent NYC on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. We will be right back. Welcome back to Represent NYC. I'm New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. State Senator Brad Hoylman has emerged as a leader in Albany on a number of key issues. And I'm so delighted that uh, Senator Hoylman could take the time to be with us. Thanks for joining us, yeah, Brad. Yeah, thanks for having me, Tom. And our studio is right in your district here. It is indeed, right in the heart of Hell's Kitchen, Upper West Side, a great neighborhood that uh, really reflects, I think, the diversity of my district, which extends from the east side of Manhattan to the, to the west side. And prior to your election to the state senate, you certainly have been immersed in so many of the community issues, head of the community board, involved with so many nonprofits, worked partnership for New York City, a very important leadership role. You brought your knowledge and concern for the community, your, your expertise in education, Harvard Law School, 
I was looking at the bio. I didn't know. Don't hold it against me. I mean, look at that. Don't hold it against me. That and, you know, (laughs) about 25 gets you a cup of coffee. But, boy, uh, you certainly hit the ground running when you uh, arrived in the Senate. I saw that. But you really have emerged as one of the key leaders. You just wrapped up the session. Uh, You had a number of priorities, some successes, but a lot of disappointments. Uh, You know, in terms of going around your district now that you've been home, um, what are you hearing and what do you say to your constituents about the unfinished agenda and what your priorities will be as we go through the rest of the year and head into next year's session? Well, something that you know I've encountered getting on the subway, which, which I ride almost every day when I'm not riding a city bike, someone will come up to me and say, Senator Hoyleman, I'm usually like, you know, so pleased that they would recognize me. And then they say, without missing a beat, fix the subway. Yeah, yeah. And so there's this real crisis in our mass transit that I believe most New Yorkers feel correctly hasn't been addressed. It wasn't addressed in our last session. It, 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 you know, there's a plan put forward, uh, but we need to fund it and we need to figure out how to do that. The leadership at the MTA seems to have figured out, and there's been some changes there, you know, what the, what the plan is. But the, 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 the issue is how to pay for it. And, and that's where, you know, this back and forth between the you know, the city and the state, and I guess to be more specific between the governor and the mayor, that continues to create an inability to resolve. But that is going to be uh, an issue for the city. And, you know, I, you know, I live on Long Island. It's an issue in terms of Long Island Railroad, Metro North. And when we talk about the economic strength for New York City, which is key to the, the economic health of New York State, if we don't have a, 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 a quality public transit system, uh, we're, we're going to fall backward. And, and there is a lot of concern uh, about uh, going back to the bad old days of the 1970s when there was uh, so much neglect. So I think the focus is there. That's probably better situation than it was two or three years ago and and a recognition of the problem but but certainly more work to do and I know you'll continue to try to build coalition with uh, suburban and urban members to to deal with this issue there were some other issues though that you were very very involved in the the child victims act I know is a big issue for you women's reproductive health and 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 certainly in light of the changes on the US Supreme Court and we can talk about that as well Um, if you go back for a special session what do you want to see get done well, certainly with all the tumult in Washington and a new Supreme Court uh, nominee who has made it clear he opposes a woman's right to, to choose and, and a decision that he wrote for the D.C. Circuit, we need to make certain that New Yorkers, New York women, are protected. And as you know very well, we do not have the standard of Roe v. Way in our statutes here in the state. And we have to fix that through passing the Reproductive Health Act. The problem has been thus far the Republicans and their unwillingness to bring any bill involving women's health to the floor for a vote. So I think a special session would be useful if only New Yorkers who may have those senators uh, as a representative would know where they stand. Because yeah. up until now, they've been able to you know, bob and weave around the issue of reproductive health saying things like, we don't need a bill, we don't need a law in New York because it's constitutionally mandated. Well, now the time has come to put that to the test. So uh, a special session in connection with that would be very, very useful, I think, for, for voters. Yeah, I mean, I think to your point, Many New Yorkers may not realize or don't remember, uh, they may be too young to remember, New York's laws on abortion predated Roe v. Wade. And then when Roe v. Wade came in, that became the standard. And everybody said that is the standard. But if Roe v. Wade falls, then it defaults to the New York law, which goes back to, I guess, what, the early 70s or 1970. And, and there's some pieces of that law that, that don't make sense by you know, our, our understanding of, of the issue in 2018. You know, so a few years ago when this bill was first proposed, some people said exactly as you point out, we don't need it, but, but who would have thought we're in this situation? And I know you pay close attention to what's happening with the Supreme Court. You're the ranking member on the Judiciary Committee, among your many other uh, important committee assignments. It, it is, a, I guess, a stark reminder that as much as we feel we control in our own state and, and your work as a legislator, we are very much at the mercy of what's going to be coming out of Washington. The court changes. You know, in our reports on risk to the state budget, by extension, the city budget. And thank the, you for the, this. Well, we try to just point out to it because people need to know uh, the, 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 the Trump agenda in terms of cutbacks on health care and education and housing. And, however you feel philosophically about some of those issues, it will be a real financial hit 
on the city and the state at a time where we've been in relatively good shape. So people say to me, so, you know, well, are you worried about the economy? Yeah, you're always worried about economic cycles. But what could hit us from Washington is, is, is really um, uh, the biggest concern uh, that I have. Uh, tell us, uh, getting back to the state issues of the Child Victims Act, you, you've really been, you've been, I, I don't know, every time I pick up the paper and that issue is being debated, you're the one who gets quoted. How, how is it that we haven't resolved that issue? It's a problem because we have so many adult survivors of child sexual abuse in the state of New York and they currently do not have the opportunity to bring their abusers to justice, to confront them, to seek civil redress in courts because of our outdated and really punitive statute of limitations for child sexual abuse. If you're a young person and you've been abused as an adult, you have only until the age of 23 years to file a criminal or civil claim against them. So once that time has passed, you have no redress whatsoever. And what that means, Tom, is that not only is your life damaged, and not only do you have that pain and suffering for the rest of your adulthood and the inability to, to bring closure to that issue, but that predator who abused you is off scot-free. And we've seen time and time again in New York that these predators who have groomed young people and abused them take advantage of this loophole and continue to abuse children in institutional settings, whether it be schools or yeshivas or, or, or churches. And mm. we really have to put a stop to that. New York's statute of limitations is the most punitive in the nation. Mm. So we really are protecting the predators by virtue of this law. And we need to turn turn that around. And uh, you know, I'm really disappointed that once again the Republicans would not bring that bill to the floor for a vote. They actually broke their own rules and would not allow a hearing on it in the Judiciary Committee, which as you note, I'm the ranking member. Mm. And they continue to, to basically stall. Yeah. Uh, once again, though, I think the voters are going to have something to say about it in November. November. Speed cameras, that's in the papers every day. Is that, is that likely, if there is a special session, to be on the agenda for sure? Well, I think there's a lot of impetus to do that because the, the current law expires at the end of the month. And it's just beyond me that we couldn't come to some resolution on something as life-saving as speed cameras in front of our schools. The data from the Department of Transportation shows that they have been effective in reducing speed and lowering the number of crashes. I have a daughter who goes to public school. There was a crash outside of her school just uh, about a year and a half ago yeah. where someone was injured. There's no speed camera there. Uh, the, the, the artificial number that uh, has been set for speed cameras should be raised. I, I think it should be, the cap should be lifted in, in its entirety. Well, what, are, what are people afraid of? Getting tickets? For God's sake, this, these are children's lives. And it is interesting that we did manage, though, to uh, renew the law that allows ticket scalping in the state of New York after much debate <laughs> and hullabaloo and a lot of lobbyist efforts. But you know, we couldn't come together and renew the law to extend the use of speed cameras outside of schools. That really is a telling statement yeah. about where the priorities are in the state Senate. Yeah. LGBTQ issues, very important to all New Yorkers. Transgender community, that's been one area where New York needs to do more. What, what's your sense about how, uh, how well or not so well we are in dealing with that, the well, issues related I, to that community? I really appreciate your work on examining our hate crime statute, in particular as it relates to transgender people. So thank you for that. Um, you know, transgender people since Trump's election, the truth is they are the most targeted population in the country when it comes to hate crimes, more than any other group, whether they be religious or ethnic uh, minorities. Um, so here in the state of New York, we still do not have what I would regard as a transgender human rights law. Uh, transgender folks are not protected by the hate crime statute in any part of the state of New York. Not to mention the fact that while the governor has taken steps to um, prevent discrimination from, you know, health care institutions or educational institutions. Those are just executive orders and have not been put into statute. So we need to pass the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act. It's long overdue. Transgender folks were intentionally omitted from our uh, Sexual Orientation Non-Discrimination Act uh, back in the 90s because it wouldn't pass it in wouldn't the pass Senate. Out, it was there, I remember. And yeah. it's too bad yeah. because it's still the case yeah. to this day. Yeah. The, the, the Senate is so 
bad on LGBTQ issues that there is not a single specific LGBTQ bill that has been brought to the floor for a vote since wow. 2011. Wow. There is a change dynamic in the Senate, though, and we're talking a lot about things that didn't get done in dysfunction, but there is some hope now with the, the Democrats coming together, you know, they're basically with three conferences plus one person, I guess, depending yeah. on how you count it. How, how different did the session end from when it began, where you had you had the group of Democrats that were sitting separately and then you're all coming together. How's that, tra how's that transition been working out? Well, it was a little uh, odd and awkward at first, to say the least. Um, but I think we finished the session strongly, mostly due to the leadership of Andrea Stewart-Cousins, who is a real conciliator. She's someone who uh, doesn't hold grudges and looks to the future. I think that's the kind of leader we need in the Senate. Mm. And I don't think it's a coincidence that that a woman is the type of person to get that kind of job done. She's mm -hmm. a great collaborator with her membership and even the Republicans. So I'm, I'm looking forward to her continued um, management of what by most accounts is a pretty difficult situation when it comes to the number of factions that we've had in the state Senate. Yeah, I think many of us thought the city, the state, the nation was moving in a certain positive direction, and, and I sense a fair amount of concern and despair out there. And someone like you gives me hope and, and gives, I know, your constituents inspiration. So, uh, Senator Hoyleman, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Controller, and keep doing what you're doing. We're so appreciative of everything that you're providing, not just my colleagues in the Senate uh, and the Assembly, but uh, every taxpayer in the state of New York. Well, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. Get back to those great constituents here in Manhattan. And when you see Senator, Man, Senator Hoyleman on the street, say hello, Senator, and tell him what your priorities are, and Brad Hoyleman will address them. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you, Senator. I also want to thank New York City Central Labor Council President Vinny Alvarez for sharing his thoughts with me today. I hope our conversations have provided some helpful insight and perspective to some of the issues that are shaping New York City. I'm New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. Thank you for watching Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network.